Let's talk about disease and immunity. So the way that the virus works is it gains entry into cells by binding to ACE2 receptors, which are expressed on the cell membranes of epithelial cells of the mouth, trachea, and lungs. And this is the primary means of contracting the virus, having virions make contact with the cells of the respiratory tract. Once a virus gains entry inside a cell, viruses hijack the cell's molecular machinery to replicate their genomes and use it to create new virions. Eventually, the cell bursts open and releases many copies of the new virus. The ACE2 receptors are also expressed in the lungs, kidney, heart, liver, and small intestine, leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome, kidney failure, heart injury, liver dysfunction, and diarrhea. As a result of the ACE2 receptors also being expressed in the small intestine, the, the virus finds its way into feces, making it so that fecal transmission is also possible. The first line of defense that the body has against allowing pathogens in is called nonspecific immunity, or immunity that's not specific to any particular pathogen. This comes in a few forms, mechanical barriers such as the skin, mucous membrane, and tears, as well as chemical uh, protections such as the acid within the stomach and enzymes in various bodily fluids such as tears. Within the category of nonspecific immunity is also the inflammatory response such as heat and swelling. Specific or adaptive immunity is responsive to specific pathogens, but it requires a targeting system called antibodies. Antibodies bind to surface features on the surface of the pathogen that are called antigens through a mechanism called lock-key matching. Namely, an antibody needs to have matching features that match the antigen specifically so that it will bind specifically to that antigen and not other things. Once those antibodies adhere to the antigen, in this case a virus, they trigger an immune response like phagocytosis, such as white blood cells consuming the virus. In order for a body to be immune to a specific pathogen, it needs to have enough antibodies present. In order for those antibodies to be present, the body first needs to be exposed somehow to that pathogen, and the two mechanisms are referred to as natural exposure, which is contracting the virus initially, and artificial exposure, or vaccination. So we can see here a plot. If there's an initial exposure to a virus, there's a response within the body to kill that virus, to produce antibodies that will target that virus and destroy it. And then on subsequent exposure, the amount of antibodies that match that virus is enough to cause a very rapid immune response that ramps up lots of antibodies and targets that uh, virus very effectively and causes it to be killed off very rapidly. And that's what immunity is. Now, it takes time in order for the body to generate those antibodies that match the antigen of a specific disease. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, the amount of time that it takes is about six days. In the meantime, until the body can produce enough antibodies to kill off the disease, the disease grows exponentially inside the body before being killed off. Okay? So because of that exponential growth of the disease and because the disease is damaging to the body, there is exponential tissue damage. That's exponential with how long it takes for the body to respond to that disease. If natural exposure occurs, if, in other words, if you catch the virus, the real virus, it's best if the initial exposure is minimized so that the total tissue damage during the incubation period is minimized. If the initial exposure is much higher, then the amount that the virus will be present within the body and the amount of tissue damage caused by it will be much, much higher. Vaccines or artificial exposure work by exposing the body to a weakened, engineered version of the pathogen, which has identical antigens on its surface so that the body will produce matching antibodies in order to fight off the disease, but it's not as harmful as the actual disease. But by having those antibodies present, 
in the body, subsequent exposure to the real pathogen will elicit a much faster response and a more effective response. Now, developing and testing vaccines takes a long time, largely because it takes time to confirm that they elicit the correct immune response. Typically, typically vaccines take years to develop. Now, this virus has, um, it's on a fast track for a vaccine to be developed, but it's very, very optimistic to expect one this year. For a reality check, this is a quote from, a, from an esteemed epidemiologist, you can make a vaccine against anything very quickly, but it needs to be effective and safe. This is a long process that can take months to years, even under optimal conditions. Now on the topic of mutation, RNA viruses like the flu typically have high mutation rates, about one mutation for every 10,000 base pairs. Most of those mutations are either neutral or harmful to the virus, but every once in a while they'll get lucky and they'll find a mutation that's beneficial to the virus. The flu has a unique ability to mutate the code that describes its major antigens, allowing it to evade immunity on an annual basis. Coronaviruses are also RNA viruses, but they have a little bit more mo moderate mutation rates owing to a proofreading exonuclease. SARS-CoV-2 can be expected to mutate at a rate similar to other coronaviruses, so unlike the flu, you can expect immunity to be effective for several years. The unfortunate bit, of course, is that at the moment, nobody is immune to it. Now in the next video, we'll talk about the fundamentals of disease spread.